All right, so you guys don't want to miss this one. Today we're going to be breaking into not only where the markets currently are, but also some long-term strategies that could be maybe something you want to look at around the potential, which most likely passage of ETFs and what that might look like long-term and how you play the market. We're going to dive into all of that good stuff. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into it today with Dr. Jeff Ross. Uh, he's been on our channel many times before, so I want to welcome him back into the show. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Hey, Paul, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Thanks again for stopping in. All right, so Jeff, I, I want to cue into a few things here. Obviously, this is a big week with a lot of releases of you know, data. Obviously, the Fed is going to be digesting a lot of what happens this week, including CPI, et cetera. Headline CPI, I want to go over to this first story. Headline CPI expected to have spiked higher in August. Uh, but core rate is, of course, uh, slowing just a little bit. And there's a few points they hit on in the article here. They expect the CPI to jump a little bit more in August uh, or triple the pace of July's 0.2% increase. And then the core CPI is expected to have, to have dipped to a 4.3% uh, year-over-year uh, pace in August from July's 47 So with that being the case, and you look at where the current status is, obviously you get a chance to you know, go into uh, a lot of what's happening in the market with Valshare Capital, which is, you know, your own your own program. What are you guys seeing out there in terms of uh, the pressure that CPI could or could not cause on the current market? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I've been uh, suggesting for the last few months that the period of disinflation is over. It was, it was a nice time period, right, where we went from a CPI of about 9% down to about 3%. Um, that was great, but I think that period is over now, and these these uh, metrics and these predictions are starting to show that more regularly. Uh, I think what's more likely to expect going forward, at least for the second half of uh, this year of 2023, uh, we're probably going to have choppy sideways. I think we're going to be range bound somewhere between uh, as low as maybe 2.5 percent, which would be great, uh, up to about four and a half percent. I think, which would be kind of uh, not very surprising to me. Uh, you brought up the course. CPI that continues to fall. The reason that's falling and, and the regular CPI is not is because it strips out energy. So as people have right. probably come to realize, oil oil is kind of going back into a bull market again. Um, that's great if you're investing in oil, but it's rough if you use oil and gasoline and things like that, which most Americans obviously do. So I would not be surprised to see uh, CPI just continue to sort of hang around and linger at these higher levels for a while and be somewhat problematic. I don't see an easy fix for the Fed. I, I like to say regularly that the Fed actually, despite popular belief, they do not control inflation. They cannot just turn the switch off and on and say, okay, we want we want disinflation again. It's out of their hands. This is a market-based decision. And as long as oil and other commodities continue to rise, I would expect to see inflation uh, rising or at, at the very least staying flat, staying stagnant uh, for the near, uh, the near term. So we have uh, Chair Powell obviously queuing up, getting ready to make some decisions on a lot of this data that's being reported this week. When you think about the current status and then also the incoming of the commercial real estate impact on the market, what we'll see most likely from the jobs numbers, things of that nature, how does this play into it? Because now he's got really two quarters worth of data to look at, at least from a historical side. Where do they start trying to create a strategy to maybe move us out of this potential recession, whether it's Q2 or maybe even as far as Q3 of next year, what are some of the key things that they're gonna be watching for? Well, I continue to think that Powell and company, the FOMC, that they actually want a recession. They may say that they don't and talk about the harmful effects on Americans, and they talk about that a lot, is at least regarding inflation and the effects that that has, especially on the lower income earners here in the United States, right? The cost of living goes high because the cost of your goods and services are increasing. That makes life harder and harder for regular people. And so they do discuss that. Uh, he sort of like, you know, gives a hat tip towards that. Uh, but I think what he really wants wants is a recession. Uh, why? Because that will help drive unemployment higher and that will actually bring at least temporarily 
temporarily speaking, it will bring inflation down. We may actually have a bit of a deflationary type bust at some point if we get a recession. He would count that as a victory, right? And I think most Americans would count that as a huge slap in the face. Like, congratulations, yeah. you're out of a job. Uh, but at least that brought uh, prices down for a bit. Um, I just think that this is the story of this decade. Uh, again, it's it's very different from the 70s, but in some ways it's similar to the 70s in that inflation was volatile, much higher than we were used to, and it sticks around and it becomes this sort of monster that that uh, it, it, it becomes apparent to everybody over the years that it's not in the control of the central planners. It's going to be a problem for most of this decade, I think. You have the market, of course, reacting a little differently. It's continuing to see a little bit of the S&P, especially of an uptick over the past 30 days. But then you look at over at what Jamie Dimon's talking about, and he's basically making this statement, uh, hey, it's a huge mistake to think the economy will boom. So the market obviously responding somewhat positively, uh, I guess in general, when you look at the S&P, we'll show a chart here in a second. But Diamond's been kind of in and out of being right and wrong. Do, do you think he's right this time in saying, hey, we still have some headwinds coming at us? I do think he's right. And I think it's important for most people to continue to separate the two things, right? There's the economy. And then on the other side, there's the markets. And yes, they're related, but they're not the same thing. And so they can react differently. I like to distinguish the two because markets for themselves, the control of the markets or the directional uh, directionality of the markets has been wrested by the central banks. That happened back during the global financial crisis. Basically, when they came in and flooded the markets with liquidity, what that did is it wrested control from the underlying economy uh, of these market reactions. And so what we're seeing, I think, right now is a lot what Diamond is saying. The economy itself continues to look like it's going to roll over at some point. I still think we're kind of set up for a standard garden variety, painful, albeit, uh, recession. I still think it looks like it's coming maybe later this year or sometime in 2024. Um, the can uh, keeps getting kicked down the road a little bit, but markets can respond differently and they respond to underlying liquidity. Um, uh, you brought up the S&P 500. The S&P and obviously the NASDAQ are um, driven heavily by basically the mega tech uh, sector, right? The big tech mm -hmm. stocks, they're, they're, they're the majority of the gains right now and everybody is still kind of hyped about uh, AI and things like that. Those stocks tend to do well in basically any set of economic conditions, except when we have slowing economic growth and slowing inflation. When you have that one-two punch, that crushes tech stocks. Right now, we don't have that. We have more of a stagflationary type period, and tech stocks right. can actually kind of hang in there during a stagflationary period. So that's how I would explain that uh, with the market Yeah, looking at the chart, I look back all the way into March of this year and even to where we are trading at right now at about 44, you know, 44, 70, that's up 16%, 17% right now on the, on the S&P. So with that being, I mean, because some people would look at that and say, all right, does, this does not look like a recession is coming. And you look at the indicators that we've had, you know, an extensive pressure from the Fed in terms of raising interest. Now you've got money market funds paying out considerable amounts of, you know, literally no, uh, no risk yield. When do you think that strategy is going to start to shift for what's happening in the market right now? Because there's so much liquidity that's starting to come off sides here. Do you think we'll see maybe some liquidity come back into the market? Or do you think everybody's going to continue to push for staying in these very conservative plays, whether it's money market or some of these bonds? I still think there's going to continue to be that real strong pressure to move to the left, move to the safe end of the risk curve, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so enticing for people, right, to get a, a basically perfectly safe 5% yield on these short-term T-bills right. uh, or just move into money markets, right? Money markets, which are kind of based on these uh, T-bills, uh, they all have this sort of 5 plus percent rate. That's very enticing to a lot of people. And so liquidity, I actually don't see a huge slew of new liquidity coming into the markets anytime soon. I think that's the last thing that Powell actually wants to do. And I don't think that they're going to revert back to flat out QE uh, until their hand is forced, basically until the the, um, the markets seize. Uh, maybe there's some uh, kind of more cataclysmic style event. And I, I would expect that to come from the commercial real estate and regional bank sector, which are intertwined. Um, mm -hmm. If something like that happens, where it's a massive uh, uh, seizing of markets, then they would be forced to come back in and start doing QE. But but until then, I don't think people should expect uh, any type of uh, significant liquidity. I think we're going to continue to see, at best, 
this crab sideways, choppy sideways movement in liquidity. And we've been, by the way, just for people uh, who may not be aware of this, net liquidity in the United States is basically at the exact same level as it was back in April, late April of 2022. So we yeah. have been in this sideways crab market for quite a while. And I think we're just going to uh, continue to see more of the same. Jeff, what do you make of uh, some of the data that's coming in on U.S. Uh, commercial bank deposits? This is a good chart to kind of break down from Joe Consorti. And he hits on all the markers here, which is declining and flight of capital moving out of commercial deposits, which means that companies now are starting to park in these money markets. We're starting to see that kind of movement, which again, starts to put a lot of money on the sidelines. Where does this stop? And, and how much of more pressure are we gonna see on the banking system around things like this? This continues to put a ton of pressure on the regional banks, right? I'm not w worried at all about the major banks, the, the behemoths, the big four or five. They're going to be fine. This doesn't really affect them very much, doesn't affect their bottom line, even though they are losing deposits too. This really does affect regional banks. You know, Americans aren't stupid. Uh, they, they can only put up with earning, you know, 0.1% in their bank savings account for so long before they start asking around and asking other people, what do they do? People are starting to move them to brokerage accounts and putting them into money market funds. Uh, and even even some of them are using treasurydirect.gov uh, and they're buying T-bills. They're buying these 5% mm -hmm. uh, rates uh, on these short-term uh, treasuries. And so that's just what's happening. And that puts a ton of pressure on these regional banks. Uh, I, I think we're going to continue to see increased usage of the bank term funding program and other emergency liquidity uh, measures or spigots that the, the Federal Reserve uh, provides for these regional banks. But again, all they're doing is continuing to kick the can down the road. And at some point, it will come to a head. Uh, and I think as the flight continues, I think we'll see more of that. I think we're going to see more regional banks struggle. I think we're going to see more of them using these uh, liquidity patches that the Federal Reserve is providing. Uh, but we're definitely not through the woods yet. And as 2024 hits and more companies are forced to try to recycle their debts or roll their debt forward at these much, much higher rates, uh, a lot of these uh, businesses are going to start going down. We're going to see bankruptcies, I think, uh, significantly increase in the coming 12 months. Well, that's the, that's the one area that really concerns me is when you look at the potential. We've already seen a rise in the bankruptcy numbers uh, you know, to an escalated point that we haven't seen in probably a decade or so. And back to your point, when you continue to see a lot of pressure here, because now you're talking about credit pressure, especially with small business, which really just creates another vacuum in the job market. And then we see those lagging indicators really start to pressure against uh, the markets in general. Um, and, and I don't want to be all doom and gloom here because I think there are some opportunities. I want to I want to jump to kind of the next chapter here, and that is talking about ETFs. And as we see some of the ETFs starting to flow into the market, obviously we've we've reported I think quite a bit here on what's happening with BlackRock, what's happening with Arc, and many of the others who have really put themselves in a good position, maybe to get an ETF approved. But what's new? is the dates. Right now I'm looking here at the current dates and if you look at kind of some of the uh, scenarios that play out right now, you've got the iShares BlackRock uh, coming on October 17th. So that's here just around the corner. Uh, also pretty much everybody, VanEck, Bitwise, uh, Wisdom Tree, almost everybody with exception of the refiling by GlobalX. So with this being the case, do you feel like this is the time in which Gensler might take an opportunity to go ahead and say, all right, we're going to go ahead and do a sweeping approval here. It's definitely, um, I, I hate making these predictions, right? Because I can't get into Gensler's head and, and who knows what he's thinking. I know he wants to delay it, it seems like, as long as possible, but there's a lot of mounting pressure on him and it just continues to build and build for him to uh, approve these. Uh, and his excuses are, are getting smaller uh, by the day right. or by the week as, as new news comes in. I don't like to make a conjecture. Could he approve them? Sure. It, it, to me, it, at this point, it's about a coin toss. Will they get it all approved? I do think, by the way, to your point, they all will get approved within probably a week or two of each other. I think it's just going to okay. be kind of one huge batch of approvals. If they do, I don't really see any major advantage to anybody as being the first mover. I think we're going to see uh, quickly within three months, we're going to see maybe 10 to 15 of them being approved. And so it's just going to be whatever uh, people, whatever product people see that has the lowest fees, things like that, offers the best service. Um, 
Will he do it? I don't know. Uh, if he does, I think it would provide a nice impetus. I don't think it is the impetus. Again, I just believe that liquidity is the lifeblood of markets. And if there's no underlying liquidity support, especially in an economy that's trying to grind to a halt and we're, we're heading to these stagflationary conditions, I don't think anything is going to boom. So if we do get a big spike, say, say Bitcoin does get approved, we get these spot ETFs approved. I do imagine we would get a short term spike, but I would be, yeah. you know, I would be concerned that it's going to fade quickly uh, and, and head back down to lower levels. Yeah, this is kind of my position is uh, with ETFs in general, especially a spot Bitcoin ETF is the timing of the market may not be perfect. If if in the case of where he's going to have to make a decision at some point, maybe in, even as early as Q1 of next year. But even at that point, we could be in a much deeper and more dire position, you know, economically that would only, you know, dictate a little bit slower action on an ETF for a Bitcoin. Now, granted, it might be a great opportunity for BlackRock and others to be able to you know, enter in some very interesting spots in, in terms of Bitcoin as a value. Additionally, you've got some other things happening in the ETF space. Here was James Seyfried from Bloomberg coming in. Uh, Hashtex has filed now for a spot ETH um, ETF, joining ARK Invest and also VanEck. So now you've got Ethereum at the at the you know, kind of at the trough as well. Do you think that we could see an ETH ETF spot maybe come out at the same time a Bitcoin ETF spot comes out? I'm just kind of, or do you feel like that's going to be more of a strat strategy for them to be longer down the line? Yeah, I think it's possible, but unlikely, uh, mainly because Gensler, as the head of the SEC, uh, he has cast doubts about Ethereum, right? He sees Bitcoin as kind of its own separate asset as a commodity. It's basically energy money. And then all of these other proof of stake cryptos as being, as we all know, right? He, he, he deems them securities, whether he's proven right or wrong in the, in the court of law, we'll, we'll see. That still remains to be seen. But he he personally feels that way, and he has a lot of power currently, uh, even though he's being it's being chipped away. Um, so I would, if I had to guess, I would say it's not going to be approved as quickly uh, as Bitcoin. I think they're going to put up a, a fuss, uh, and they're gonna, there's still a little bit of a battle to be fought over: is Ethereum an actual commodity or is it a security? I think that the case is closed already with Bitcoin, but I don't think it's closed with Ethereum. Yeah, one thing to note on the ETH, because I think for some of our audience, uh, this was an interesting tweet. This was kind of breaking it down on, and mainly because of the staking uh, risk-free, you know, earning capacity of what ETH, ETH is doing right now. But it could generate rewards higher than the management fees, which would be kind of interesting around an ETF. So I don't know how that's going to play out, because th these are obviously all new kinds of assets that are hitting the market, especially if Bitcoin and ETH come into an, an ETF. And I want to talk about how your strategy going forward. I want to show the um, the Veil Shares your latest blog post. So for you guys uh, checking out a long term play on this, uh, Jeff has done a really good job with this. Here's a tweet. Also, I want to hit on Sailor believes that there's three key factors that's going to drive Bitcoin to five million: inevitable approval. He thinks the spot ETF is still a critical component. Banks now with the new FASB rules, bank holding Bitcoin, using it as collateral for loans, and then fair value accounting. Uh, with the FASB rules that just got approved. So those three things that are pretty big deals right now, and that would be very interesting. Now, the question is, is that's a much longer horizon, you know, with, and, and Sailor talks about this all, all the time, that these are very long horizons. What are your thoughts? Are these the three catalysts that you feel could be the thing to watch? I think they are. Uh, yes, I do think they're really significant catalysts for sure. Uh, I think basically as you continue to break down the barriers uh, of uh, Bitcoin ownership uh, for both individuals and for corporations and for nation states for that matter, it will obviously more people are going to flood into it. It's just clearly to me, at least as a guy who studied it for man eight years or so now, uh, I just believe it's better money for a better world. So as the world catches on to that, uh, more and more people will pile into it. So I think his his 5 million price target to me, I think, yeah, for sure. It's going to be there at some point, no time soon. I mean, I think we're looking yeah. 10 to 20 years out somewhere where we're talking about prices like that, maybe sooner if, if, if things, you know, go really well. The one thing I would add to that, uh, is basically when, uh, will the accounting rules change for individuals? It's a huge hassle right, right now, now to use yeah. Bitcoin to right. If you want to go to uh, buy a coffee or buy whatever you want to do, 
trying to keep track of your cost bases is a massive hassle in, in getting tax on it. I think what needs to happen at some point is the IRS needs to come out and say, you know what, we're going to treat it like a currency for, for tax mm. perspectives. And and I think I think there's going to be a two-part thing. I think first they're going to try to glean as many taxes as possible from people. So they're basically going to have a one-time huge tax hit. I don't know how they'll do that. I don't want them to do that, but I think they will try to do that because they want their taxes. Uh, and then after that point, it will be treated just as a currency and won't be taxed for making these day-to-day purchases like it currently is. What do you make of the Grayscale win here recently against the SEC? This was a tweet kind of, you know, giving a little bit of of light at the end of the tunnel for Grayscale holders, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust holders. How do you think this plays out in the markets? Should BlackRock get the approval first? Because Grayscale is kind of setting in a time warp right now. They have like a 45-day window that has to occur how do you think that plays out, especially with Grayscale being uh, obviously could be getting approved as an ETF as well? Right. So that's interesting. And that's, you know, Grayscale is on its own different time schedule. So it would be sort of weird for them to get left out in the cold while these other mm-hmm. spot Bitcoin ETFs got approved first. I, If I had to bet, I would say that it's going to be Grayscale first just because they've been through this process for so long. I, I would yeah. be frustrated if I were them if they got delayed while all these other ones got approved well ahead of them. Um, so we'll see again. I don't have any, uh, you know, inside information uh, from what, for what these guys are going to do. But I do think it was encouraging uh, for for these guys that that basically the SEC got slapped down by the judge and it was decided to be, you know, arbitrary and capricious. I do think that definitely reset the stage and added some optimism. I, I'm very, you know, I've been I've been talking pretty pessimistically. I'm very optimistic for what's coming. So basically, after the having Q, uh, the second half of 2024 and beyond, I think all of the pieces are, are, are coming together. All of the stars are aligned for a massive bull run once we get through basically this recession, uh, once the uh, central banks are supporting the markets again, uh, once all of the infrastructure is in place and the SEC is basically has the back of Bitcoin and these spot e- e- ETFs. I think it's setting the stage for some pretty impressive price action, but it's, you know, it's no time soon, not in the next couple of months. But uh, if you have a time horizon of two plus years, I think you'll be well rewarded, if, especially if you're looking at today's prices. Yeah, for sure. That brings me on to the next uh, topic, and that is how to play this from a longer time horizon. This was a piece done by Joe Consorti with you guys, I guess partnered with Bailshare, uh, breaking down your your September update. So I went through, we looked at this. I want to kind of scan down into some of the areas, primarily into the uh, your, your mode. So you've got your aggressive section here. You've got Adobe in here and on equities. Tesla's in here. We like uh, some of these, then you get into sound money, which is, of course, MicroStrategy, uh, and some of the Bitcoin miners, uh, two thirds of a position right there. Veil Shower moderate position, Adobe still, Tesla. Uh, and then further into it, you get into the section of ultra conservative, uh, both also a little bit different in terms of the layout. And then I want to get into the, the Bitcoin proxy, because this to me is the, is the real question. If when the ETFs pass, I mean, we're going to get an ETF approval. I feel like that's a, a done deal. Um, how would you proxy from a strategy, especially with micro strategies? Because at that point now, you'd be essentially be able to go directly into a spot. How, would that change your strategy of how you'd move forward on this? So yeah, so I would definitely have to assess these as they become available, uh, available products out on the markets. But I still think I'll lean towards MicroStrategy for, for for a couple reasons. One okay. is that first of all, it's run by the Giga Chad Michael Saylor himself, who is very you know <laughs> fanatically pro Bitcoin. Uh, so that's one reason. Two is because there's no fees on it. Even the cheapest ETFs will have some sort of management mm-hmm. fee. Owning yep. Microsoft has zero management fee, so that's another you know check in its favor. Uh, and then third. Third, it's actually a bit of a leveraged way to play it. So if you believe in Mike and Michael Saylor's strategy of, you know, uh, basically handing out equity in order to be able to uh, increase his Bitcoin stack, uh, as well as, you know, take out low, uh, low interest rate loans uh, right. to further leverage his Bitcoin stack, it, it has the potential and has shown so far to actually outperform Bitcoin versus these spot Bitcoin ETFs. I think they uh, they will underperform just because of their management fee. Um so I'm most likely, at least at this point, to stick with MicroStrategy as my main Bitcoin proxy. 
Okay. Uh, well, I, I, it's good to know these because I think you're right. There are, it's, it is a completely different strategy and you're right. We don't know enough about what these products are going to look like in terms of fees, but also just the performance of how Bitcoin's going to respond you know, in its own right of how the market pressures will kind of play into this. This is, a, I want to play a clip for you. This is uh, David Marcus who comes in from LightSpark. He's the CEO over there. And we've, uh, we've talked about LightSpark quite a bit, but he makes some statements here that I thought were interesting. I wanted to get your opinion on his statements. Let me play this clip for you. Where does this go? And does Bitcoin ever really become a currency, which is what you talk about it becoming? Do you think the value of Bitcoin needs to or can move up if it's actually a currency? Meaning I've always made the argument the currency problem is if, if Bitcoin is, if you think Bitcoin is going 30 or 50 or $60,000, there's no way I'm gonna spend it on a, you know, a pizza yeah. or on anything, frankly. Mm -hmm. Um, if I think it's going to go down, by the way, I might spend it immediately. Our, our, so our view is actually that Bitcoin is not the currency that people will use to buy things. But a fragment of a Bitcoin on top of Lightning is like a, a small packet, data packet on the Internet, only for value. And so you can exchange at the edges of the network and send dollars to someone that will receive Japanese yen on the other side. Uh, or send dollars to someone who will receive euros on the other side. And uh, the actual net settlement layer that is used is basically Bitcoin, Lightning, and it settles in real time, cash final, and at right. a very, very low cost. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, LightSpark, very active in development on the Lightning Network. What David was talking about, former PayPal guy, um, he's talking about Bitcoin not being used as a form of cash. So it's really a, still a speculated asset, which is the way I look at it. What are your thoughts on how and if Bitcoin starts to move into that zone? Do you think it ever will? I do think it will, but I think we're a long ways away from that. So I still think we're in kind of the price discovery phase of Bitcoin, and I think it has a long ways to go. Uh, what do I mean by that? Right now, the market cap of Bitcoin is about 500 billion-ish, a little under. Um, I think we're going to be more interested in as a medium of exchange once it gets to sort of the 50 trillion uh, level market cap, somewhere between 10 and 50 trillion. Um, at that point, I think a lot of these huge gains will be um, a thing of the past. It will become more stable at that point. And then also, much more importantly, a couple things. I think the the whole second layer and third layer infrastructure will be built out so it'll be much much easier to use it's still a hassle to use there are people who get upset with, at me when i say that but it's still it's tough right you still can't yeah, walk it is. a grocery it is store and, and pay with it and then what i talked about earlier the tax treatment of it is still a huge hassle so it needs to be treated as a currency by the irs in order for people to be more willing to spend it i i yeah. tell people that people think people are only going to continue hoarding it uh because it is such a good store of value i'm i tell you though for people who own a lot of bitcoin what they're waiting for, they will be enticed by higher prices. There is always a market for this. Uh, mm -hmm. And so whether that means you're getting Bitcoin at 25,000 or you're waiting until it hits 250,000 or 2.5 million per Bitcoin, uh, and at that point, we'll just be talking about sats and not Bitcoin itself. Um, people will sell their Bitcoin for goods and services um, uh, at some point in the future. And then one last thing I like to say, because it is this different kind of money, because it's an appreciating store of value versus fiat currency, which is a depreciating store of value, I believe it will make uh, consumers much more discerning, right? You are not going to want to part with your Bitcoin unless you feel like you're getting a very good good or service or house or whatever it is that you're buying you're not going to be you're not going to be willing to trade your bitcoin for a product or service unless you think it's very worthwhile last question to you um, on this uh, jeff is you look at paypal paypal has made some interesting moves obviously with their stablecoin pyusd paypal now expands their crypto uh, accessibility for us users uh, through both on and off ramps so this is kind of unique in the sense that they've integrated in some wallets, they've made it a little easier to move in and out of crypto into bank accounts, traditional finance, you know, if we'll call it TradFi. Do you think this makes a big difference in the future of adoption with a company like PayPal? Because I feel like we still need the banks to be able to do this, to truly go this direction. Fidelity's kind of done a good job at it right now, but they're still not really, you know, a B of A, they're not a Wells Fargo, you know, et cetera. What are your thoughts on, on that strategy that PayPal is taking? 
Right. So I think it's a good sign. I don't think it's a massive sign, right? I'd be way more excited if it were, uh, to your point, a huge traditional bank. I look at it sort of these three categories. We have traditional finance, the old big banks, the JP Morgan's Bank of America, those kind of places. Then we have the fintech companies that everybody was all excited about last decade, which includes obviously PayPal, uh, mm -hmm. Square or Block is in there, lots of other companies like that. And then, you know, the modern day, more Bitcoin, the crypto sphere sort of stuff is kind of the more on the edge of where technology may be going. So the fact that we're seeing this sort of middle layer start to embrace the future, and I think that's a good sign. I think they're reading the tea leaves as well and saying that, yeah. you know, it looks like this stuff isn't going to die. It's not going away. And if anything, it's going to expand. And wisely, if we want to exist 10 or 15 or 20 years in the future and still remain relevant, we need to get in on this. So they're, they're making, I think, smart moves from a business perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I don't begrudge them for doing this at all. Jeff, it's always fun uh, chatting with you. If you guys want to learn a little bit more about what Jeff is doing over at Valeshire, make sure and check his website out. It's just valeshire.com. Uh, they do a great job, obviously, uh, on investing. So you guys can check that out. We'll leave a link down below. Just always uh, thanking Jeff for coming in on our, on our show. But thanks again for stopping in today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Have a great day. You bet. All right. So you guys are tuned in. Maybe you're thinking about the Diamond Circle and you're going, what is that? Well, it's our additional content that you can grab and it's very easy. It's free. And of course, it's an email that comes out to you. We do a podcast over there, additional analysis. We drop in some sentiment data, all sorts of nice things that you guys can get. Just use the link down below to join. It's very simple. If you guys want to follow me out there on Twitter, it's just at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.